your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 10, and that's where we're going to spend this morning together. Now, Daniel has been doing a, a process from chapter 1 all the way to the end of his book, and that is to repeat himself and then to enlarge. Remember in Daniel 2, he talks about that multi-faced image of different types of metals. Then he repeats that when he talks about the different beasts that represent those same kingdoms. The book of Daniel outlines from the time of Daniel what's going to happen to God's people all the way through the end of time. Most scholars believe that Daniel was about 16 years old when he was led captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And by the time we come to the 10th chapter, most scholars believe that Daniel is about 90 years old. And he said he was walking along the Tigris River, Tigris River, around 35 miles from Babylon, about 100 miles from the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf. And it was in the spring of the year, the third year of King Cyrus, or about 535 B.C. In Daniel 10, we gain a glimpse of the unseen struggle between Christ and Satan. Daniel, in chapter 10, actually is pulling the curtains back and allow us to see this great controversy, this spiritual warfare that's taking place. And talk about spiritual warfare, if you hold there in Daniel 10 and flip to Ephesians chapter 6. Paul, like Daniel, is pulling the curtains back and allowing us to see the characters in this great controversy. That Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. You all there? It says, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10 that behind idol worship are demons. So he keeps pulling this curtain back and trying to remind us that there are demonic powers at work. And in chapter 10, Gabriel is dealing with one of those demonic powers that is holding Gabriel back from answering Daniel's prayer. Now in spiritual warfare, it's important for us to know the enemy's battle plan. But more important than knowledge, we need to have an intimate relationship with our God. Isn't that right? Amen. So in Ephesians 6, Paul tells us it's not just enough that you know that there's a devil and you know that he has a war against us. But in Ephesians 6, verse 11, he says, Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So how do we defeat the devil? Putting on the armor of God. The whole armor, not just part of it. That's a very good answer. The whole armor of God. So let's go back to Daniel 10, beginning with verse 1. Daniel 10, verse 1. And in the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was also called Belshazzar. And this message was true and concerned a great war. And he understood the message and gained insight by the vision. Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. And verse 3 says, I ate no, cho no choice foods, no meat or wine came to my lips, nor did I anoint myself with oil until the end of the three weeks. 
Now, Daniel had been studying Jeremiah's 70 week prophecy. And you remember in Daniel 8 and 9, Daniel was thinking, wow, maybe we're all going to go back home. The 70 year prophecy is over. And then Gabriel says, no, there's another prophecy you need to be aware of. And it's as Daniel begins to discover these things that he becomes so discouraged that he doesn't eat his regular food for like three weeks. Because he wanted to keep his mind clear and sharp to try to understand what Gabriel was presenting. Notice verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, I was beside the great river Tigris. What's troubling Daniel is, is he's learning about a new crisis, one that, one that he hadn't expected. And you see, Ezra 4 tells us that the Samaritans were declaring war on the, on the 50,000 Israelites who returned back to Jerusalem. And they were bribing the governors of different countries to tell King Cyrus of all the terrible things the Jews were doing, that was they really weren't true. They were actually lying to King Cyrus. And Cyrus was beginning to wonder if he should rescind his decree for Israel to return back to Jerusalem. Now remember, there were three decrees. The first one was by Cyrus. And the devil is trying to stir up so much conflict that the king will rescind his decree and that it will thwart God's plan for the redemption of mankind. So the devil is doing everything he can do to get King Cyrus to rescind his decree. And Daniel's hearing this news. Now they didn't have cell phones, so it's a little interesting to try to figure out how these messengers could go back and forth. But he's discovered that the altar has been been built, but the rest of the temple still lays in waste. And what does Daniel do? He prays. Remember in Daniel 2 when he was threatened with execution? Did he start complaining? No, he prayed. Remember when he was thrown in the lion's den, did he start fussing at the little lions? Did he say to them, holy guys, I'm a vegetarian, you can't eat me. No, he didn't. Did he start complaining to God? No, what did he do? He started praying. And now in Daniel 10, when he's hearing that all this, um, all these things that the Samaritans are doing against God's people, what does Daniel do? He's back on his knees in prayer. So what does that tell us? When we're facing challenges, what should we do? We should be praying, seeking God's presence. Daniel is feeling the weight of these challenges. And he is distressed as Gabriel begins unveiling to him what the future is for God's people. And it is upsetting to him. Now remember, Daniel's 90 years old and he's, he's in Persia. And if you drop down to verse 20, you'll see that Daniel discovers who the next world power is. And it tells us that the next world power will be Greece. That the stability of Persia will come to an end. Daniel was longing that his people would return to the home of their forefathers and that they would experience renewed peace and prosperity. But instead, he's learning from Gabriel that there will be many heartbreaks and that their future will seem incredibly uncertain. And so Daniel collapses under the weight of such burdens. Notice verse 5. I looked up and I saw a man clothed in linen. Around his waist was a belt made of gold from Opus. Six, his body resembled 
beryl. Now, what color is beryl? Anybody know? What color? Green. Green? Now, my Bible says yellow jasper. Now, why is that important? Because in the breastplate of the high priest, one of those stones is beryl. And so we're getting another glimpse of the sanctuary. It says, goes on, says, his face had the appearance like lightning. His eyes were blazing like torches, and his arms and feet had the gleam of polished bronze, and his voice thundered forth like the sound of a large crowd. Daniel is being given the vision of Jesus Christ. Much like the vision that John got in Revelation, much like the vision that Ezra got in his encounter. And Daniel describes the body of Jesus as this glorious being. And having one, having one of the stones of the breastplate of the high priest, he also talks about his garments of linen, which is something that a king would wear. And so Daniel is painting the picture for us, as does John, of Jesus as both our high priest and our king. Amen. You remember when John saw this vision in Revelation chapter 1, he fell to the ground. And Daniel really does the same thing. Notice with me, verse 7, it says, I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me didn't see it. On the contrary, they were overcome with fright and ran away to hide. Verse 8, I alone was left to see the great vision, and my strength drained from me, and my vigor disappeared, and I was without energy. Verse 9, I listened to his voice as I did, so I fell into a trance-like sleep with my face to the ground. And verse 10, then a hand touched me and set me on my and set on my hands and knees. Like John, when Daniel saw Jesus, he fell to the ground until Jesus touched him. That is verse 11. He said to me, Daniel, you are of great value. Isn't that wonderful? That God views us as great value. The devil tells you you're not worth anything. Well, technically he's correct, isn't he? But in Christ, we are priceless. He says, Daniel, you are great value. Understand the words that I'm about to speak to you. So stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he, did, when he said this to me, I stood up shaking. Can't you be nervous? We get nervous standing in front of important people. Verse 12, then he said to me, do not be afraid. It literally means stop being afraid. And continue to stop being afraid. It says, for from the very first day you applied your mind to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to your word. Daniel's been fasting and praying for 21 days. And he's being told here, I've, I've already heard your prayers. And I'm here to answer them. He says, I have heard you and I come to you because you sought me. That's one of our problems is we tend to go through life's challenges and we forget to seek God. Daniel is a wonderful example to us that no matter what happens in life, the first thing we need to do is to seek God, to, to, to seek His peace through whatever challenges we face. And so what, what Daniel is telling us that, that God cares for us and He's mindful of us. And that's our greatest strength in spiritual warfare is this tool we call prayer. So 
we don't need to have all of our questions answered. As long as we know that God hears us. And we don't need to have all of our problems solved because we know that God is with us. Amen. And He will walk with us through whatever problems we're going through. We just like to know the end quickly. And God sometimes says to us, be patient. And He is an infinitely powerful God. And when we're in prayer, He comes to hear us. And He gives us that assurance that He is faithful to us. Verse 13, however, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was opposing me for 21 days. How many days was Daniel praying? 21 days. So this whole time that Daniel was praying, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was opposing Gabriel. It says, but Michael, one of the leading princes, came to help me because I was left there with the kings of Persia. So who is this Michael? Well, although many Christians believe he's an angel, he's not. Michael means one who is like God, or one in the likeness of God. And the Bible tells us that Michael is the archangel. That means that he's above all the other angels. There's not once that Gabriel is ever referred to as an archangel. And there's nowhere in Scripture where any of the angels are referred to as an archangel. So who is Michael? Who is this great prince? Well, if you, get, if you look at the coordinates, you'll find there are 15 references to Michael. Ten of those references are people by the name of Michael. My middle name is Michael. So there are a lot of people in the Old Testament who had that name. But there are five references that we need to be thinking about this morning. And three of those are found in the book of Daniel. One's found in the book of Jude. And the fifth one is found in the book of Revelation. Michael, the archangel, is Jesus Christ. Even though there's a lot of confusion out there, the Bible is very clear of who Michael is. He is not a created angel. He is not at the level of angels. He is the creator of angels. In Daniel 8, 25, Michael is referred to as the prince of princesses. And Daniel 10.13, this is where I'd like you to look at this morning. Daniel 10.13, which Carl read for his prescription. It's but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but little Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me. Now, 10 verse 13, can be a little challenge to understand because when he says, one of the chief priests. This is a, pardon? Yes. Well, the King James, unfortunately, translates it as one of the king of the princes. Which translation do you have? Good. They fixed it. Because the word one, a cod, is often translated as first. Like the wife of the president is the first lady. Which changes the whole meaning of this text when you realize it's not one of the chiefs, but it is the first of the princesses. And the, and the prince of the kingdom of Persia. This is not Cyrus, the king of Persia. This is someone far more powerful. So powerful that he was a challenge for, for Gabriel. 
So it would appear that this prince of the kingdom of Persia is Satan himself. So here you have Gabriel at war with Satan. Remember, Jesus calls him, calls Satan the prince of this world. In chapters 8 and 9, God sends Gabriel to help Daniel understand. But in verse 10, God sends his son to intervene and to defeat the prince of the kingdom of Persia. If you hold your finger there in chapter 10 and flip over to chapter 12 of Daniel, there's another interesting insight into Michael. Chapter 12. It says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Notice Michael is not called a great prince. He is called the great prince. There is no prince greater than Jesus Christ. He's also identified the one who stands for the children of thy people, which means he intercedes and defends, even stands as a substitute. And our substitute is Jesus Christ. John tells us that, we, that Jesus is our advocate. Notice verse 14. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people. When does it say? In the latter days. For the vision pertains to future days. Verse 20. He said, do you know why I have come to you? Now I am about to return to engage in battle with the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece is coming. So remember, from Daniel 2, we learned that Babylon was the ruling power when Daniel was taken captive. And who came after Babylon? The Medo Persian Empire. And who would follow the Medo Persian Empire? The Greece Empire, which is what we're told here in verse 20 that the prince of Greece is coming. And Alexander the Great went to battle against. A different Darius with 40,000 soldiers. That was pretty impressive, didn't it? 40,000 soldiers. So you realize that this king of Persia had a million soldiers. And Alexander the Great defeated Darius and his one million strong soldiers. Verse 21 says, However, I will first tell you. What is written in a dependable book. There is no one who strengthens me against these princes except Michael, your prince. Amen. That's good news. Gabriel was challenged in his battle against the king of Persia, a metaphor for the devil. Jesus easily defeats our enemy. Amen. That had to be words of encouragement to the children of Israel because their temple was destroyed. They were in captivity. They have gone from Babylonian captivity and now to Persian captivity. But God is in control. Yes. Now there's a painting in the Vor Museum called Checkmate. And it's a picture of two beings playing chess. One is the devil, and the other is a man. And in the background is an angel. If Satan wins the check, the checker game, chess game, excuse me, then he gains that man's soul. If the devil loses, the man is free. Well, there happened to be in this particular art gallery, and this art, piece of art was, was painted in the late 1800s. This chess player, this champion chess player, happened to see the picture. It makes sense he'd be intrigued, wouldn't it? Because he played chess, and there's a picture of chess. 
and he studied it for several hours. And then he cried out, the artist got it wrong. The man has, the man has one more move. According to this master chess player, the devil who thought he was winning was in fact losing. And the man who thought he was losing was in fact winning. Remember Daniel got thrown in the lion's den? 